Hello, I'm Jesse Kornberg, the Skirball Cultural Center's President and CEO. And today it is my honor to welcome you to a very special conversation with visual artist, filmmaker, and activist Ai Weiwei. Over the course of his career, Ai Weiwei's body of work has addressed the struggles of some of the most vulnerable people in the modern era. Refugees seeking safe haven, communities affected by poverty, and everyday citizens living under oppressive regimes. These have been the focus of Ai Weiwei's work. In fulfillment of our mission, the Skirball amplifies stories like the ones Ai Weiwei tells, seeking to illuminate our shared humanity across national borders and cultural divides. To that end, we are very proud to present the exhibition of Ai Weiwei's work called Trace. This portrays more than 80 individuals who have been imprisoned for speaking truth to power. We have been able to undertake this work thanks to remarkable support from Steve Tisch, Billy and Stephen Fisher, Chara Schreier, Gordon Freund, Engaging the Census Foundation, and the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. We look forward to welcoming you to this landmark installation as soon as it is safe to gather in our museum. In anticipation of that occasion, we hope you enjoy today's conversation between Ai Weiwei and the Skirball's exhibition curator, Yael Lipschutz. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Yael Lipschutz, curator of the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles, where we are honored to be in conversation with the internationally renowned artist and activist, Ai Weiwei as we discuss the power of art and filmmaking as tools to advance social justice. Ai Weiwei was born in China in 1957. When he was one year old, his father, the celebrated poet Ai King, was denounced by the Chinese Communist Party and exiled to remote Xinjiang province in Northwest China, where Ai Weiwei spent the first 14 years of his life. In 1978, Ai Weiwei enrolled in the Beijing Film Academy and began working as an artist across disciplines, architecture, sculpture, performance, film. Over the years, he has exhibited widely at museums and biennales across the globe. And as his work has developed, he has become increasingly committed to his guiding principle of promoting human rights. The impetus for this talk is Ai Weiwei's exhibition, Trace, which the Skirball will be presenting in 2021. Trace, which was organized by the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, is a monumental artwork constructed from Legos, featuring 176 portraits of prisoners of conscience from around the world. Trace foregrounds Ai Weiwei's own experiences of incarceration. In 2011, Ai Weiwei was jailed and detained for 81 days by the Chinese government for his critical voice. This experience was the basis for his 2013 sculptural installation called Sacred, which was installed at the 55th Venice Biennale. In 2015, when his passport was returned, Ai Weiwei moved his family and studio to Western Europe, where he's created a number of films that shine a light on human rights abuses across the globe, including Vivos, The Rest, Coronation, Cockroach, and Human Flow. The Skirball will be hosting virtual screenings of a selection of his recent films, including Vivos and The Rest in 2021. Weiwei, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to start by asking a question about your films. In 2017, you made a film about the global refugee crisis called Human Flow, capturing what is in effect the greatest human displacement since World War II. It follows the fate of migrants from 23 countries, including Afghanistan, 
Iraq, and Syria, who due to war, famine, and climate change, have been forced to leave their ancestral homes. Your 2020 film, Vivos, explores the forced disappearance in 2014 of 43 students from a teacher's college in Southern Mexico, a leftist leaning school known for its strong tradition of labor organizing. You are currently making a film in Brazil about the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and about China's growing influence in South America. You're making a film in Myanmar and just released another on the Hong Kong protest movement. It is clear that as an artist and human being, you see the world as completely interconnected. Could you please talk about how the places and subjects in your films are bound together? And please feel free to refer to specific places and specific films. Hi. First, it's uh, very nice. Uh, it's uh, my privilege to to share some moment with you about my recent career and also about my activities. Since 2015, I had a, a permission or had my passport back from a Chinese authority. So after that, I, by the end of the 2015, about the same time, I uh, take my partner and my son to visit the uh, Great Island, Lesbos. Um, the reason we went there because um, for months, is the refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Iraq, are flooding into Europe. And uh, th this is the, the location they, they take a boat uh, from Turkey and uh, across the ocean. And the um, majority of them uh, landed in Lesbos. Mm -hmm. So that visit um, opened up a whole process. So I, when I'm standing on the shore to see those boat carries uh, those um, children, women, men, and oddlies to, to climb up the shore, I realize this is much something much bigger and then something I never have experienced in China. And uh, with a great curiosity, and eager to learn global politics and uh, to understand who they are and why they have to leave their home and come to Europe. So we started the journey and uh, to do research and to, to really answer those questions. Um, we start with uh, uh, making a film because that will uh, force me to really conceptually to structure the knowledge and also to put uh, a much balanced view about the situation. So we, from Les Wells, we our studio have to travel to um, Turkey and uh, the border between Turkey and uh, Syria. We try to get into Syria, but it's not possible. It's a it's a war. It's it's very dangerous. So so we managed to go to other locations, Jordan, you know, also the border, and uh, Lebanon, and uh, uh, then we, we went to Jer Jerusalem and uh, uh, Gaza area. Our studio also uh, went to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, you know those those areas still uh, have the war. And uh, uh, the finally, I managed to go to Mexico uh, border between U.S. and Mexico. So the whole journey, uh, we visit about forty refugee camps. 
interviewed over 600 people. Among them are officials, NGO, and the UN workers, and the refugees themselves. Mm -hmm. So that helped me to build my knowledge and understanding about what is happening, not only in the, the troubled area, the war zones, but also in Europe, because every refugees have to dealing with the new policy, the attitude, and the actual uh, possibilities to resettle and to be mixed in into a modern society. So that have become a very important journey for me. So during that time, I made uh, three refugee films, uh -huh. uh, Human Flow, the rest, and another one's already finished, but we will put uh, up next year, called the Rohingyas, refugees from Myanmar and the settled in Bangladesh. So this year we have four films come out, but the one we have to delay it because it's too too crowded. So uh, Vivos, the first one, then uh, Coronation about Wuhan, uh, this pandemic uh, origin, and uh, now we have the uh, Cockroach, uh, the film about Hong Kong's uprising. So those films uh, seems um, focusing on very different topic, uh, very different uh, political issues, but they have something very familiar, very, very, how do you say, very, uh, I singled out some topics such as humanity, human rights, and uh, human dignity. And, uh, you know, all those issues I've been concerned uh, since uh, since I was born, you know, since I have some knowledge, it's, it's always in my mind. But if eventually, uh, with today's uh, possibility, the internet, the technology, I can I can eff effectively uh, film them and produce them, um, so we can give to the public as a visual artist. Uh, film is one means of the expression. It's not, uh, it's very unique. It's not better or, 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 but it's very unique because it speaks the language everybody uh, could understand, you know, somehow. Because people like to see narratives uh, about the story and about the personality and the situation. And do you, do you see a connection, for example, between the work that you're doing in Brazil and documenting the destruction of the rainforest and then this economic factor of China's growing influence in South America? Do you see that as somehow connected to the refugee crisis and to other, other situations you are documenting? Uh, yes, I like to answer this this part. And uh, since I'm doing since uh, uh, far apart geographically, or the issues are uh, not directly connected. But uh, if we look at uh, in today's uh, global situation, all those issues are interlocked. It's uh, it's really connected. Um, when, when China is getting much stronger, they definitely need to uh, develop and uh, uh, the resource, the nature resource uh, are really in demand uh, in every aspect. So when Brazil have to uh, cut the trees down, and to to make the rainforest disappear, to give the, the land to the farming for for beans or for for some other plants, 
and uh, China would be the ultimate buyers for the beef and for the agriculture products. And that, uh, that demanding is very, it's huge. It's almost uh, unresistible. You know, you cannot refuse it. So uh, under this uh, uh, globalization, we can see um, the border is not exist anymore. And the, no matter what kind of ideology and the political uh, beliefs or, or religions or different races, and we become one. You know, something happened to the donkeys in Africa. Um, they have to kill those donkeys because China is buying those skins. The way China buying it is not just one or two donkeys. It could be hundreds of thousands or millions of donkeys. And those skins are make a cosmetic product for the ladies to treat their skin because they believe those, uh, those ingredients in those donkeys' skin are best for this kind of uh, uh, cosmetic uh, using for, for, the, for the females. So you can see uh, all those things are unbelievably connected. Uh -huh. And that definitely affects uh, our environment mm -hmm. in, in many ways, uh, affects our global, uh, you know, uh, temperature or, or uh, affects uh, our, our animal fair, you know, uh, animals are being sacrificed for human desire. And uh, it's not just one, but millions of millions and the daily. So this is a, uh, 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 once again, raise our questions about our humans' uh, moral and philosoph philosophical standing. Yes, yes, I, I think, yeah, these are the challenges that the planet faces, that we're all so connected and how to, to navigate the connections. As you move around the world, could you speak about the similarities and the differences in your work as an artist and your work as a filmmaker? I'm thinking about what goes into creating your large scale installations in museums versus what goes into making one of your films where you and your crew are oftentimes working in difficult and sometimes very dangerous um, conditions. I. As an artist, it's just uh, like a title, and uh, every artist uh, uh, behaves or or acts very differently. And uh, for me, I two things uh, is very important. First, uh, I have a great uh, curiosity. I like to learn more about who I am and what. Uh, is my my status in relating to human society. So that is uh, is my why I want to be an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, second, I think uh, I'm always find myself when I uh, get into some areas or some territory which. I am not clear about, you know, I am not familiar with. So I have to set up those obstacles for me to, to really understand, um, you know, my decision or my aesthetic judgment, moral judgment, and all those are so, so important for me. So my works generally is produced after my understanding mm -hmm. and uh, those relatively uh, rat relatively is very simple and easy it comes out naturally mm -hmm. first i have to convince myself that comes through very strongly in the films there i mean you're 
in vivos, you know, you're so close to, to these communities. And in, in the refugee camps, in your film, The Rest, you very clearly have developed very strong relationships and, and you're there with your crew. And so, so yes, it comes out um, very clearly, the, the connection that you're making with, with your subjects and with, with viewers. Um, do, do you have, as a filmmaker, directors or certain documentarians that you feel close to uh, or influenced by? Um, I'm, I should say, if I, in my works somehow, I may uh, not meet the high standard only because I didn't influence by anybody, but uh, really self-educated person and uh, you know as documentary maker that is a challenging test how close you can get yourself uh, with the reality mm -hmm. confrontational and also sometimes you have to disappear you know to to be in the atm atmosphere, but also at the same time disappear. So that means you have to be totally emotionally involved to identify with the 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 one you interview or or all those victims because most uh, films are really focused on those unfortunate ones. So that takes not a, a filming scale, but rather a understanding, a deep understanding and deep about the humanity. And uh, I have been prepared since I was born. So it comes naturally with me. The mm -hmm. people I interview, uh, they, they are relaxed, they are open, and they are, they trust me. That trust is not easy um, because uh, Everybody who really want to reveal the truth is a sacrificing. It's a, so I need a, a moment of a true communication. Under the lens, under the film, can clearly tell that. So you have to trust the, the true communication and you have to trust the, the real the lens or do the, do the justice to those uh, meaningful uh, communications. Yes. Um, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times last year titled Capitalism and Culture Side, in which you referred to the relationship between China and the West. Can you elaborate on that relationship and on the broader relationship between economic systems and cultural pathology like racism that you talked about in that article? I almost forgot what I've been talking about, but basically um, the idea <clears throat> behind it, yes, China and the West, and suddenly burst out a lot of argument and uh, it seems US or the West start to re re recognize China's uh, position. And, uh, but I think uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, misunderstanding about China. China is a, is a state that never has been through industrial revolution, never really uh, had uh, this uh, renaissance or, or an enlightenment, you know, it's not a religious society. And uh, the biggest Chinese uh, struggle in 20th century is uh, become a communist state or they titled it as a communist state. Basically, China is still a federalistic society and uh, with uh, the title as communist, but the actual practice is a state capitalism. So that 
combination made, made China very unique. Uh, it's not, there's no democracy, there's no freedom, personal freedom, there's no uh, freedom of expression or independent judicial system. There's nothing like the West, but there's something like the West is they're they are almost relentlessly uh, seeking profit uh, through the productivity and uh, to, to grab every opportunity um, from the smallest to the biggest uh, possible. You know, they, they would do the job the West would never want to do, you know, to either it's a labor intensify, you know, or it's, um, it's pollution, polluted, or it's uh, the profit is too small, but they take all those jobs in past 30 years, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe from pennies to, uh, you know, to accumulate the, their, their today's uh, economic status. And uh, at the same time, they're, they're dreaming to have a uh, uh, build up of the uh, space programs and, uh, and also um, biochemistry engineering or, or you know, highest uh, engineering uh, development, such as the research of the pandemic, you know, all those area. Because China believes the soft power would bring would upgrade their their product, and they will be a real competitor uh, of the West, and they did very successfully, and uh, because they have a clear vision, they, because this is a one party system, is really need one person to decide everything. There's no struggle, no culture or religion. Uh, or you know different ideas. It doesn't exist. Anybody raise a voice can be just put in jail, like like I was being put away and disappeared. And many many uh, people, lawyers and uh, activists, are uh, disappeared. And uh, basically, uh, I think if you look at this uh, game, and the, the natural question is, does U.S. or West really understand China? I think the answer is no, they don't really understand China. And China is going to become a stronger and a bigger and a, will be, uh, you know, dominant uh, the next uh, decades. Uh, if nothing really, really major will happen. So that's, that's my point of view about that. In that article, you talk about how um, Western corporations uh, mm -hmm. are connected to, to China. Um, and of course, we're, we're very, very intimately connected to China. And so you, you make um, statements about um, labor issues happening with Western corporations in China and, and try to sort of bring out that this economic system, the capitalist mm -hmm. economic system undergirding the world, uh, ultimately, it is, is, is at the root of these issues, which for you also relates to the, the, the racism that you experienced in Germany. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, if you see China's growing power as a problem and the West is being very implicate, implicated into um, the economic system that China is part of. What is the answer? What, what is? I, I thank you for bringing this up. It's very serious uh, um, question, and I never really imagined as a, a museum um, director would like to even discuss those issues. You know, it's very uh, getting very interested. Uh, in these issues. I uh, basically if you look at the world, what dominates uh, 20th century or the uh, very beginning of the 20, 21st century is capitalism. You know, under this capitalism uh, um, 
we in the West established uh, uh, democracy, or or at least you have a flag of democracy and the personal freedom, which really is regional, uh, almost like a religion, regional religion, and uh, people always think we are benefited and we are free person and we we have all the rights, but the education and the mainstream are not uh, not exactly tell the full truth. And the West can enjoy the, the, the stability and the prosper, mainly not only because democracy and the freedom, but also because, but I think most important because the, the, the ruthlessly capitalism exploration and that exploration and uh, uh, I cannot just stay at home. It's not possible. You know, you need some place which is poor, which eager, uh, eager to work, who contributes to the labor and contributes to the resource. And without that, it's not possible. The early industrial revolution is also based on early colonial, uh, you know, activities. That's whole human struggle. It's not about right or wrong. That's a, a real, um, you know, real reason why we develop so fast, why we enjoy today's modern modernism or, or, or comfort, you know, but uh, our education avoid to give the full story. So that uh, make our understanding about today is not complete. You know, can we really challenge those issues? And uh, why China is different, why India is different, why many, many parts of the world uh, they cannot really um, catch up. And uh, because we are our society, if you look at the United States or Europe, where basically is a cooperative authoritarian society, uh, is, is, you can clearly see even our elections uh, has to be spending so much money this is almost unthinkable for democracy to spend billions of billions of money, uh, not to see money behind, but uh, in, uh, below the table, but only on the surface are so big. And uh, then at the same time, you can see you don't have much choices. People doesn't even have choices. They have, they're forced to vote for someone because they dislike the other, or you know, the the the, the choice are so small. How can you call it a democracy? So what is really wrong with this, this society? We have to really think uh, uh, much deeper and much profound. And then that is the cooperative, the real uh, force, which um, which supports the social development. We can see that way, and uh, they are so powerful. They they have no border. They have no nationality, and uh, they represent uh, only by the profit. And in that sense, um, it's it's horrifying actually because any political struggle, the little argument we have, you know. Uh, you know, uh, racist or brutality or or all kind of argument. It's not a deep argument, and uh, you cannot solve it. It's not possible uh, because those forces are will never be uh, will never be affected because those authoritarian cooperative uh, power. That's why China is very arrogant. They think U.S. cannot really stop them because you see their words is, I'm in your side and you're in my side, inside of me. You know, how can you, it's not possible to just cut off your arms or your legs, you cannot move. So they are very well calculated with American businessmen, Wall Street, politicians. They have so much sense in common and in the deep, deep communication.
and they understand each other so well. So the, the rest is just bubbles. You know, they don't, they don't really care. That's, that's, I make it simple, yeah, but it's even more complicated. Yeah, it is very complicated. And I, I mean, in the United States, we, we are constantly in our media um, hearing about China as a threat, as an economic threat and as a humanitarian threat. And even within that, which might seemingly offer some, some helpful critiques to the world, that internally, domestically in the United States, often results in, in anti-Asian American racism in the United States, where we're, we're calling out um, China in a way that, that filters through the society in, in, in insidious ways. You know, one of the things that I was very struck by in your film Vivos were, were the shots in the elementary school where the teacher is talking to these very young children, you know, five, six, seven years old, and he's saying to them, you know, what are your rights as, as children and as, as human beings in the world? And they're raising their hands and they're saying, we have a right to education. We have a right to be fed. We have a right to be healthy. And I've never encountered such, such education in, in my own life. And I was just very um, impressed to see these, you know, what are really profound goals and ideas being um, shared with, with such young minds. So anyway, maybe that's where the hope lies. Um, so I'll move on to another, another question. I, you know, one of, looking around at the world struggles and you look so globally um, as an artist and filmmaker, a question that arises is how do we bring this critical energy of protest, of organizing and dissent together so that nations are helping each other, so that communities are not alone, alone in their struggles? The Hong Kong protesters who are the subject of your new film, Cockroach, are up against China, a giant regime. We've seen a massive turnout in the streets of Hong Kong over the past 21 months. During this same period, the United States saw Black Lives Matter, the largest protest movement since America's civil rights movement, grow stronger. In the wake of George Floyd's murder by the police this past summer, Black Lives Matter became a global call to end racism across the planet. Just the other day, I read statements on Twitter by some prominent leaders of the Hong Kong protests, such as Jimmy Lai, the billionaire media mogul, repudiating Black Lives Matter protests. Jimmy Lai was actually just arrested last week on a charge of foreign collusion. Joshua Wong, who you also interview in your film, was also arrested. Joshua Wong has been photographed with hardline American politicians such as Tom Cotton and Marco Rubio, who both recently called for a U.S. military crackdown on Black Lives Matter protests. Could you talk a bit about these disturbing developments, but also what you make of these strange contradictions? in terms of two dissident movements that presumably should find common ground. The Hong Kong protesters are called pro-democracy protesters. The Black Lives Matter protesters could just as easily be called pro-democracy protesters. So how do we bring about solidarity across the world? I think your work is going a long way to do just that. First, there is some uh, echoes. The sound very strange. Now stopped. So <clears throat> I don't know what's happening. When you talk, there's a, there's a voice there. So maybe tech technical person should fix that part. 
Yeah. Uh, well, um, the world is not simple. It's not complicated. There's no. It's uh, it's like a body. You have a different、uh, organ, have a different disease, but one medicine would good for this organ, but it would hurt another. So it's very difficult for doctor even to treat the body because they have very different、um, dysfunctioning, and、uh, and so that's why we need to look at the whole world as one. We really need to have a great understanding, not to have an understanding of American first, or or Hong Kong struggle just a local issue, or the black lives was only about discrimination, but rather is more about class struggle. So I think. Or many many diseases, when they are cannot be cured or cannot be treated, only because or misjudgment. You know, if you have a doctor miss,、uh, cannot give you clear uh, uh, how to say, analyze and or indicate your what is real illness, then it will not work. So we can see in the political situation, this happens all the time everywhere. Some because the people, the mass, the people get involved, the activists are are not well educated, not very well balanced image under the, you know, sometimes they don't even care about others. Like the Xinjiang people may not care about Tibetans, Tibetans may not care about the American Indians, or or you know Chinese may not care about the black lives, or Hong Kong, you know those because we are we are culturally or or fundamentally a divided world, but at the same time politicians are use that. Very well to use that one group against another, to use military or to use police or to use minority、uh, issues or to use,、uh, you know, gays or or you know or, or different kind of social status to 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 give to leading them to wrong wrong target.、Mm-hmm. So, That makes themselves benefited and makes them feel safe. So I think this is a this is a very common. If you play a game, you know, if the real target,、uh, you you may never really know it. But so it it requires a good education, requires a a, a lot of argument. If we see a society lacking of balanced view, a good education, and uh, and uh, you know very very balanced、uh, argument, then the problem will be very obvious. You can see that will leading to racism, Nazism, and uh, and uh, those are simple,、uh, even politically correct. Uh, you know, argument、uh, can be very dangerous to the society. So it's not an issue you can solve、uh, at once. But certainly, there are certain、uh, things we we should work on. One of them is the humanity and the human rights. We are all born equally, and we we have to have the equal rights. That means. The basic rights for education, basic rights for medical care, and the other argument is is wrong. You know, it just has to be achieved. If we cannot achieve those rights, then we are barbarian society. We cannot talk about development. We cannot talk about uh, uh, 
a safer world, a more prosperous world. It's impossible because you lost the moral ground. Even United States today are, lost, are losing so much moral ground. So how can you argue about China? Yes, China is, has uh, a lot of uh, evil things happening. But if anybody who cannot really examine its own moral ground, you know, you have so many people in prison, you know, mostly are blacks or Latin, Ameri Latin uh, uh, American races, then, then the human rights record is so poor. Then you criticize China. And China, of course, they, they're laughing. They said, what are you talking about? So, so under this level of argument, nobody's going to win. China is not going to listen to the United States. They, they know all you are really bugging is about who is stronger, who makes the biggest profit. And uh, so under that kind of rationality and the moral ground, we're leading to war because we, we have to develop this, the, the faster or more uh, stronger weapons. Yes, I mean, so you're, you touched on class struggle as one of the, the roots of, of our global predicaments. In Cockroach, your film on the Hong Kong protests, you begin by um, making these statements about Hong Kong being one of the most unaffordable cities in the world. Um, and the, the way that Hong Kongers, the life is bleak and that Hong Kongers are treated as slaves. That's what you, you say at the beginning of the film. How do you think those ideas, so, so I guess, what does pro-democracy mean for the Hong Kong movement? Does it mean a return to the hyper-capitalist normalcy? Or does it mean a new type of democracy that takes affordable affordability and humanitarian issues more um, to task? It's a very complicated uh, question. Hong Kong is certainly never been a uh, most uh, uh, like a model of a democracy. It's uh, you know it has been described very well in the film, but still uh, they are afraid to totally lose this kind of very little freedom, personal freedom. They don't want to become part of China. That is very understandable because they said we if that will be end of. Hong Kong, but Hong Kong certainly is not a desirable place, and uh, and uh, there have a strong, maybe even unsolvable social problems, and so is uh, the West, Europe, or U.S. There are certain issues, and uh, which cannot be solved, and uh, that's how many you know Roman and Paris has come down, you know, it just, uh, it, it's going to rotten only because we cannot clearly, fundamentally to have our foundation, have a strong moral um, uh, uh, adjustment, you know, we cannot really have a real foundation. Then it, it, it could collapse, but to have that, it's also would limit the whole development of the of the modern world, because everything is based on competition. You know the world how to dominate. You know this 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 uh, this ruthlessly explore of the nature, and also you know all those things because every profit are based on that. So it's 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 very. Very bad situation, I should say, very cri uh, critical. But it takes every individual to be involved because we are the person who, who are sharing this uh, 
um, this universe, or they're not even universe, but this planet, and this miracle, and may easily be ruined by our short-sighted stupidity of our philosophy, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know this this can end up. So who to blame? It's only ourselves. It's not nobody else, right? You know, we 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 made all the animals disappear. We made the fishes disappear. We disappear. We pollute the air and the water, and uh, and there's still no peace. There could be、uh, possibilities of a war. You know, because there's so many nuclear warhead are waiting there, and、uh, and also no government want to listen to.、Uh, Another one, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. No. Well, your work really、um, shed light in a very, very profound way on on so many of of these issues around the world, and I think goes a long way to to help people understand the the human impact and and.、Uh, Perhaps with your your film in Brazil, the the environmental impact, the impact on on animal life, I think、um, you're doing very important work, and I want to thank you, Weiwei, for being here with us today. It's been our great pleasure. Thank you. Without you, without you know, I'm just one individual, a stupid artist. You know, I sometimes I I have some ideas. I may.、Uh, I, It doesn't really work that well, but、uh, still, the effort is needed. You know, that's what our life for. We hope for the better, and、uh, in a minute, necessary all become better. But、uh, it's always so pleasant to to share, to feel there's the other person, and who also、uh, makes the same kind of effort. So I'm so pleased to to share the moment with you, and、uh, I'm、uh, very grateful you're doing the. Very wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Wei. <laughs>